Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Joshua. I'm a pastoral intern here at Wellsboro Bible, and we are so thankful to be worshiping our great God this morning with you. If you're a guest, we want to especially welcome you, and I'd like to direct you to our starting point table. So you guys may have noticed the past couple of weeks that we have changed a few things, and this is in hopes to really condense the area we're using and to make it feel a little homier, and then also to be a little more clear as to where our things are. So at starting point, it is taking uh, the responsibility that used to exist as guest services and starting point. Now everything is going to be at starting point. And if you're looking for some counseling resources, those have been moved to the church at 45 East Ave. Um, so if, if you would like some of those counseling resources, come go to starting point, uh, meet one of our elders, one of our staff there, um, or come to the office during office hours, Tuesday through Friday. But if you are a guest, we want to especially welcome you again, and I would like you to go to Starting Point. We'd love to get to know you, and we have waiting there for you a gift to welcome you. We have Greg Gilbert's What is the Gospel? And really, this book details why we're here. It's because the gospel transforms our lives. The death and resurrection of Christ is why we live. It, it gives us life, and we seek to glorify God through the gospel. And then we also have a mug there for you. We'd love to get that to you. Do you have one of those mugs? I actually don't. You were a guest at one point. I you was, You should have yes. one. Stop by starting point on the All way right. out. Right. Thank you, TJ. Next, I'd like to point... So does that mean that anyone who comes by who was once a guest like 20 years ago gets a free mug? I mean, I have one, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Visit us at starting point. Next, I'd like to point you to your check-in tablets. So these are super important. These are to all the way at the beginning of your row to your left um, on the armrest. We really appreciate it. And would ask that you fill those out. Uh, we want to be accountable for each and every person here. And we'd love to get to know you more. And this is a perfect way for us to do that. So if you don't have your contact information, we're not going to be able to get a hold of you, um, get to know you, meet you for a meal. Um, so please fill out your contact info. Um, and if someone is coming in late during these announcements, don't, don't be shy. Get up um, and hand them that check-in tablet. Next, I'd like to point you to your bulletin. This is that white thing you were handed when you walked in. And in there is a green prayer card. This is super important as well. Paul calls us to be praying without ceasing. And this is a unique opportunity for our leaders to be praying for you. So if you have a prayer of praise or you, you would ask for prayer uh, for a specific situation that's going on, you fill that out. Um, it can be anonymous if you'd like, but it's super helpful for able to pray with you individually. There is confidentiality in these prayer cards, so um, don't be shy in that way. And what you're going to do once you fill it out, you're going to fold it up and you're going to place it in the offering plate as they pass by. So I think that's everything, except we have a special announcement from our part-time um, ministry, ministry coordinator. coordinator. Man, I was going to call her a missionary coordinator. That's not right. Ministry coordinator, Kim Brandenburg. Good morning. Hey, about these mugs, if you'd like to purchase one, you can contact the office and Lydia can make sure that happens. Thanks for cleaning that up for us. You're welcome. <laughs> Hence, I'm the ministry coordinator. <laughs> All right, so what's about to happen here in the next couple weeks is the most amazing celebration we as Christians can have. Resurrection Sunday. We are who we are. We are saved and cleansed from our sins because our Lord God, Savior, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. On Sunday, April 21st, we will celebrate the resurrection. However, we are called not to keep that to ourselves. We are to share this amazing joy and everlasting life with the people in our circles. It is not by chance that you are who you are and the people around you God has placed there for a purpose. In your bulletins, you will find three cards. Go ahead, pull out your cards. He is risen card. I'll give you a second to pull those out. Everybody hold up your cards. Let me see. All right. So there are three cards. You have two weeks. This first week, pray over the circles of your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, and your family. Who does God rest on your heart to invite them to our Resurrection Sunday uh, service? Then, through the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, you will present them this invitation now, the cards, put them in your wallets. Gentlemen, I should see you making a move like this. Pull out that wallet. Go ahead, gentlemen. Go ahead, pull out your wallets. Put them in your wallets right now. You can keep now. them out for later, too. Yeah. 
And ladies, go ahead and put them in your purses. This is the time to put them away so you can pray over them and pray who you will be inviting so they don't end up in the trash can, they don't end up in your car underneath the seat because they fall between um, the armrest. Everybody put their cards away? Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you. May your hearts be filled with the people that you are to invite to our Resurrection Sunday. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. All right, as we continue our service, we are going to turn our attention to our worship of the Lord. Uh, it's a privilege to be here together with God's people today and understand that God has actually drawn you into this place. You're here, you made it, and you're here for a reason. You don't want to miss what that is. So we intentionally begin our services by pausing, just asking that the Lord would soften our hearts, that he would keep us from getting distracted throughout this service, and that he would help his word to truly be planted deep within us. So let's just pause now in the silence of our seats. Go before the Lord. Ask him to help you get the most out of this service. Prepare your heart before him. And then I will break that silence by reading from the word of God in just a few moments. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, that your, uh, knowing in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Friends, we are servants of the Lord. He saved our souls and he's called us into his service that we might praise his name. And we're going to sing about the reason for that in a moment through a song called This is Amazing Grace. But before we do that, I want to encourage you this way. One of the things I love most about our church is the enthusiasm by which you sing. So this morning, if, if you're not used to that, if you're a guest, I want to invite you to sing out, sing loud and sing proud. We intentionally keep the volume of the music a little bit lower because we would just understand that the greatest instrument in the room is the voices of God's people joining together as one. I'd also like to encourage you, if you know how to sing harmony, don't be ashamed. Sing that out. Sing it loud. So would you stand together with us now as we sing This is Amazing Grace. Amazing grace This is a failing love 
the Lamb? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Declare that together. He is a worthy King. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. grace truly is amazing. You know, there's not one person in this room who actually deserves God's grace, but he's poured it out on us so kindly, so mercifully. He's lavishly poured out uh, his grace so that all of our sins are forgiven. Not only that, but he takes care of us throughout this life. He's leading us now. He's protecting us by the power of the spirit. He's keeping our inheritance in heaven for us. He's an amazing God. Let's continue to sing about that by singing this song together, How Great Thou Art.
sing that chorus together one more time, just our voices. Then sings my soul. Trust you believe that even more this morning. He is a great God we serve. Let's take our seats. This time I'd like to invite Holly Tobuada and Jason Keeler. They are going to come and do two things that are critical to a service like this. We're instructed in scripture that as long as we're waiting for the Lord, we should pay attention to the public reading of scripture and to prayer. And so we do that every single week here at Wellsboro Bible Church. Holly is going to read somewhat of an extended psalm, Psalm 19. What I want you to watch for as she reads is this declaration of God's goodness, his creative genius, and then his sovereign rule over the earth, and then the response that follows. That should be the same response of our hearts. That's on already, Holly. You're welcome. And uh, then Jason is going to come, and he's going to lead us in what is often a very difficult prayer, a prayer of confession, where he points to the fact that we are not perfectly following the Lord, um, that we sin every day. And as he prays, it would even be wise for you in your seat to confess any sin that you're aware of in your own heart. And that's a tense moment, but we won't stay there long because then we're going to move on and recognize that God has completely forgiven our sins through a scriptural assurance of pardon. So um, as we go through this scripture, pay close attention. As we pray, you pray in your own seats, and then I'll follow up with an assurance of pardon. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. Father, again, we praise you because you are holy and worthy of all our worship. We praise you and we thank you for your word. In it, you reveal our sin to us. Your word calls us to serve you with all our hearts, souls, and minds. But instead, 
Often we choose to serve our own selfish and sinful desires. We turn away from your desires for us and instead turn to the desires of our own sinful nature. In your word, you call us to treat others in the way that we would want to be treated. But often we mistreat those around us in fits of anger and jealousy. We harbor hatred and jealousy of others in our hearts. We hurt those around us when we selfishly pursue our own desires at their expense. In your word, you command us to share the good news of your gospel with those around us. But very often we neglect to do so. We allow fear and busyness and our own selfishness to interfere with the mission that you have laid out for us. In all these things, we confess that we sin against you. And we thank you that you give us forgiveness when we ask it. And through your son, Jesus, you have removed the penalty of our sin from us and placed it on him. And it's in, in his, his name we pray, amen. Amen. It's one thing for someone to tell you, oh, don't worry, the Lord has forgiven your sin. It's something else to actually hear that from the word of God. So we don't take our hope from the words of any man or any encourager or any comfort from this life. We find our hope in the living, active, powerful word of God. So hear this assurance of pardon from God's word. But when the goodness and loving kindness of, our God, of, our, of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Friend, if you are forgiven in Christ, you are completely forgiven. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. It is good to confess our sins so that we can stay in right relationship with this God who died for us, who we love, but our guilt can never again separate us from him. How wonderful and reassuring that is. And the most important things in our uh, most important thing in our life now is Christ. That's what bonds us. That's what brings us here this morning. That's what drives us to behave the way we do. We've been saved by the King of Kings, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to sing now again a song that points us to him called Show Us Christ. So do you stand with us now as we sing together, Show Us Christ.
turn, turn where to Christ this morning. his name. Let's take our seats. In just a moment, I'll pray for the offering. Before I do, I just want to let you know, if you're a guest here, you should not feel compelled to give. The members of this church understand it to be their responsibility to care for the needs of this body now, and also in such a way that the next generation can continue to praise his name in Wellsboro and beyond because of the faithful giving that happens today. If you are a member or even a regular attender, if you call this church your home, um, prayerfully and cheerfully give this morning to sustain that work. And for all of us, let's pray that the Lord would give us wisdom in the way we use this, these funds to declare his glory here in our area, in our nation, and in the world. Let's pray now. Lord, as we come before you and continue to worship you through the giving of our funds, we do honor you as the God who owns all, as the one who provides for our needs and even has given us so much above and beyond what we really even need. Lord, you've blessed us abundantly. And so Lord, we ask now that you'd help us to have cheerful and sacrificial hearts as we give back a portion of our income. And God, we want to see your name magnified throughout the world. So would you use these funds for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, at this time, pardon me, TV. Uh, all kids up to fourth grade may be dismissed. There's some folks in blue shirts that will bring you back to the kids area. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we're looking at verses 18 through 23. I think it's on page, yep, 1015 on your um, pew Bible. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, there are some fellows that are in the back that are going to move their way forward. If you need a Bible, uh, please just raise your hand and they'll pass you one. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, uh, you can take that home with you. That's, that's our gift to you. What a privilege to... What a privilege it is to open God's word this morning. So we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting where we left off last week at verse 18. As we read this, I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of the servants who are being addressed. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because Christ has also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks truth to us and that you have breathed out every word of Scripture. I pray that you would use it to change us, to make us servants of you that are more submissive and more loving, and that you'll supernaturally give us the ability to love our enemies. And in Jesus' name, amen. I don't get mad, I get even. Whether you would articulate it that way or not, that's certainly a motto that many Americans identify with. I don't get mad, I get even. And, and does it resonate with you? We're built with an inherent sense of moral justice. We all have rights. And when those rights, when, when our standard of fairness is violated... We demand to be vindicated. We, we want justice. And this value is celebrated in our culture. That's why we love Batman. <laughs> My son loves Batman. In fact, every night after Bible stories, we tell Batman stories. Uh, here's a guy who experienced great tragedy when he was young. And when he grows up, his life becomes about having vengeance and fighting the corrupt system that created this tragedy. We love movies about revenge. We love it when the bad guy gets nailed. On the political spectrum, there are 
is so much debate about what rights we feel should be guaranteed by our Constitution. That's why we have our Bill of Rights. And people debate these things about the Second Amendment. Should that be modified or repealed? Do we have a right to universal health care? Should homosexuals have the right to marry? Does freedom of speech really mean that you have the right to say whatever you want, whenever you want? But beyond politics, which is not why we're here, I really want to dig into what it means when our personal rights are, are violated. I mean, what do you do when you are treated unjustly? You know, maybe it's personal dealings with your family. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's when a teacher gives you a grade that you feel is unfair or at work, when someone gets promoted, when you feel you should really be getting that, or if your employer has unreasonable expectations of you, or if your pay scale and benefit package is inadequate. And there was just a strike this past week in Blossburg about these kinds of issues. Probably all of us are experiencing some kind of injustice in our life because our world is corrupt. And life here is fundamentally unfair. I don't get mad, I get even. The book of First Peter was uh, written to a group of believers who were experiencing extreme injustice. They didn't have a bill of rights that guaranteed their freedom. On top of that, many, if not most of these believers, were also... Slaves. Historians estimate that roughly a third of the people in the Roman Empire at the time of this writing were in slavery. And you couldn't be in a lower part of society. They were facing not only religious persecution, but social and economic oppression. And if you had the opportunity to go back in time and speak wisdom into their lives and write a letter to them, how would you counsel Slaves being persecuted for their faith. And how might someone who is directly discipled by Jesus himself, who is perfectly just, how might that individual counsel these slaves experiencing injustice? And Peter looks at this from such a wildly different lens than what our impulses would tell us. Instead of seeing injustice as a reason for rebellion and getting payback, he sees this great injustice as an opportunity for Christians to show our great God. And rather than fighting for freedom from it, he tells them to exercise their freedom in the midst of it by even Submitting to their oppressors and showing them love. And this just sounds crazy to our modern society. And some of you might even find this idea offensive. That what seems like willingly becoming a doormat this gives you a case of indigestion. But th this is one of those passages, it's very straightforward. It's very easy to understand, but it's very challenging to live by. So I have a statement that summarizes Peter's message to us that I believe is the thrust of what he's trying to say. It's in your notes, it's this. And I'd ask that you think through this yourself, put yourself in these shoes. When I experience unjust treatment, I will follow Christ's example. Not by getting payback, but by doing good. Doing good to your enemies. And this is one of those cases where I'm really glad we do expository preaching. 
Expository preaching is the kind of preaching where the point of the sermon is the point of the sermon, uh, the, the scripture passage, right? That we're extrapolating this out of the scripture. It's not just a guy who makes up these little cute points about it. It's actually the scripture is the authority. And if you take the Bible seriously, if you believe it is inspired, then you need to take this passage seriously in regards to injustice and how you respond to that. So let's, let's walk through this passage. Um, we have three headings as, as we unpack the passage. The first is this. It's, it's the command. Submit to your superiors regardless of their character and treatment of you. Submit to them. You know, and if you have a different translation, you might notice there's a couple different ways that this word servants can be translated. Some says slaves. Some translations, I think the Holman Christian Standard says household slaves. And, and as we go into this, I, it's important to understand that the institution of slavery, though horrible as it was back then, was, is, was very different from the more modern American concept of slavery from a few hundred years ago. Uh, slaves weren't from a particular race or even social class or education level. In the Roman world, slaves could be anything from a laborer working in a field to a teacher, even a doctor, who might be more educated than his master. That wasn't uncommon. These were people who were uh, from colonies that Rome had conquered. Uh, slavery was a way to escape death, even if you got yourself in so much debt and you went bankrupt a way to get out of that would actually be to sell yourself into slavery. And while a slave, under this context, might eventually be able to buy himself out of it, it certainly was not an enviable position to be in. Yeah, a slave that Paul, uh, Peter was writing to here, he wasn't free just to leave his job and be like, hey, I want to get a different master. You're kind of cruel and unjust. I'm going to go to the guy down the street. They couldn't do that. Um, and they were demeaned. One Roman writer said that the only difference between a slave and a beast is that a slave could talk. I mean, they, they didn't have a bill of rights or protections. There were no unions or labor laws. So what does Peter tell them? Rise up against the system. No, he, he tells them to be subject or submit to their masters. Do you, do you see how radical this is? And before you disregard the passage, because it's addressing slaves 2,000 years ago and not 21st century Americans, it's important to understand the, the underlying principle that Peter is trying to draw out in the context. So the first chapter is about rejoicing in the gospel. We have this awesome inheritance in Christ that transcends Suffering, this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, kept in heaven for you. That through the death and resurrection of Jesus, you don't have to die in your sin. You can be saved and you can be forgiven. And no matter what economic status or level of suffering you have, God's going to free you from that in heaven. What an awesome inheritance that is. And, and, and it gives you inexpressible joy, full of glory, it says, and I believe in verse 11 of chapter 1. So he's describing this awesome gospel. And in chapter 2 and verse 11, he starts sharing with us, so, so what? What do I do now? How do I live out the gospel? And in verse 11, he says, abstain for worldly lusts. In verse 12, he says, to engage in good works. And verse 13 where we studied last week, this is really key to understanding where we're at today, that he says to submit or be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And he goes on to talk about government. And in verse 18, he has the same kind of structure. He says, be subject then to your masters. And, and though none of us are slaves in the sense that he's talking about here, you can absolutely apply this to your earthly employers. And we're to do this, as it says in verse 13, for the Lord's sake. So here's the implication. Part of what it means to live out this awesome gospel that has saved you 
It means to obey your authorities that God has placed in your life. The word used for submit that we learned about last week means to place ourselves under the authority of someone else. It's used as a military term in ancient Greek writings where an inferior soldier would place himself under the rank the, and the absolute authority of someone above him. And so Peter uses the same word to describe our response to our employers and those over us. And it says, with all respect. Literally, all fear. The word is phobia behind this. Not just a half-hearted attitude like, oh man, this guy is the worst boss. I'm just going to drag my feet. No. There's a sense of submitting with all respect means you're, you're diligent. And, and most people think, well, I'll submit to my boss and I'm okay with them as long as they're fair to me. right? I, I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to do a really good job. But if my boss doesn't appreciate me, then I'm just, then peanuts to them. I could care less. I'm just going to cause problems. No, no. But Peter says we submit with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, right? That's, that's easy to do. That's why TJ and I have such a romantic relationship. He's so good and gentle. But also to the unjust, unjust master. Word behind unjust is scoliosis. You know the word scoliosis, where you have kind of a bent or a crooked spine? That's what it means, the crooked masters. Here's a boss who's morally crooked. And verse 20 even shows explicitly how terrible he is, that he even beats his slaves for doing good. So even if you have a lousy, horrible boss who commands zero respect and doesn't appreciate you and even seems to go out of his way to demean you, if we're going to take what Peter says seriously, we are to be subject to him in all respect. But why? You know, this, this is really the crux of the matter. Why is he telling us to do this? And the answer is, who, who are you ultimately working for? You know, if we're to do everything for the glory of God, is God pleased when we cut corners and undermine our bosses and we malign and gossip about them? You know, and that, that might be the easy response, to commiserate with our other uh, fellow workers and complain about the boss, but ultimately, we work for the Lord. And he has called us to submit to our authorities with all respect. And so you say, well, what, what's the difference then between being that and being a doormat, right? Just let them take advantage of you? Well, it doesn't mean you can't respectfully bring things to their attention. Certainly, if there's physical or abuse or sexual harassment going on. I mean, unlike the slaves in Peter's day, we have recourse for those kinds of things. And it would be wrong not to bring those to your superior's attention. And nor does it mean that you have to stick with the same job all your life. There, there's a submissive, respectful way in which you can move on from an employer. But if your employer is not telling you to do something illegal or sinful, then Peter's conclusion is inescapable. You live out the gospel by respectfully submitting. Because your behavior, your living out the gospel, it's not determined by how benevolent or malevolent your boss is, but by your inner consciousness of your personal relationship with God. That's why it says in verse 19, we do these things mindful of God that we're doing it for him. We're conscious of who he is and his purpose in our life. So, really, my, my question to you is, how, how are you doing in, in this area? You know, I'm, I'm not going to go in, to your workplace and ask your boss what kind of em, employee you are, but if he or she was asked, what, what would they say? What, what's their perception of you as, as a worker? 
and whether or not they're a good or a crooked boss. And, and no one is a perfect worker, except for our intern Josh and his wife Lydia. They're perfect, but everyone else is, is not. And for most of us, there, there's going to be times where we're going to need to humble ourselves. And that boss on the gas rig you're on or the corporation or wherever, who's a micromanager and doesn't even do his own job right, you could do his job better than he can. Maybe he chewed you out and you did not respond with humility. As unfair and hard as it is, You need to humble yourself and apologize. And he might look at you like a doormat, but in reality, think of the strength and self-control it takes to do that. That's that's what meekness is, right? Being meek doesn't mean you're like this Casper milk toast kind of guy. It's strength in humility and power in humility. And just maybe, through this submission and meekness, the boss is going to see that you're different. The people around you are going to see that you're different. And you're going to show them how great your God is. Now, maybe you are in, you are in one of these situations. We all have our lot. Some of us are better off than others. Some of, us, some of you guys are really suffering injustice. You're trying to do what's right, and it's hard. It's hard. But I want you to be encouraged by the fact, wherever you're at with this, that secondly, God is gracious when you suffer unjustly for him. He's gracious. Verse 19 says, For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. You know, maybe no one else seems to care about your suffering, but God cares about it. Where it says, for this is a gracious thing, literally, this is a grace thing, is is how it is in Greek. Grace is unmerited favor. God is telling you in the midst of this that he loves you, And in your situation, he's right there, and he sees what you're going through. He knows you, and and grace just pools to the low places. In the same way that water runs off mountains and into the lowest places, that's where grace is found. And when you're brought low and suffering unjustly, mindful of God, that you have this awareness of who God is and you're trying to submit to Him as you try to submit to your authority, then you are going to experience the most grace because it's far better to be struggling in the slums of adversity and find grace than for life to be easy without it. And I step back from this and I think about the perspective of a non-religious person. I mean, what's suffering to someone who's not mindful of God? I mean, without God, suffering is mindless, it's meaningless, it's horrible. There's nothing redeeming about it. Right? If you're under oppression and you're without God in your life, there's no hope. It's just pure nihilism. And there's no ultimate justice. The bad guy gets away. Life doesn't ultimately matter, and we're just blobs of self-conscious flesh floating on this huge rock 92 million miles away from the sun, and someday everything's just going to burn up, and we're going to be space dust again, and nothing can be worse than suffering. But with God, when you're in the slough of suffering, He brings tremendous meaning and purpose and even joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. And he extends his unmitigated, overwhelming grace freely to those who suffer mindful of him. This is a grace thing. So verse 20 goes on to share with us two scenarios. How are you going to respond to this injustice? Well, For one thing, you could just return evil for evil. For what credit is it 
If when you sin and are beaten, you endure, right? You might suffer because you did something selfish or stupid and you paid the consequences because that's the temptation. Someone treats you with evil and you want to respond in kind. You want to get payback and you try to do that and then you pay the consequences. There's no grace there because you're just getting what you deserve, right? If someone wrongs you, it doesn't give you an excuse to wrong them back. Well, I wouldn't have done this if she hadn't said that. Or if my boss weren't such a micromanager, I wouldn't have flipped out on him. It's, it's really their fault. He goes out of his way to make my life miserable. I couldn't help it. No. No. No one besides you can make you sin. And there is no grace in that. And you think it'll be satisfying when you walk out in a huff, right? And if you Google epic job quitting stories, you find all of these entertaining but very one-sided stories of people returning evil for evil. But when you do that, it does not satisfy you. Never burn your bridges and do something you wish you hadn't done. It is always better to do good instead of evil. Because that's the better way to respond, right? You can respond by returning evil for evil, or you can return good for evil. So he says, What credit is it if when you sin or are beaten for it, you endure? But, middle of verse 20, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a grace thing in the sight of God. Right? When, when you resist the temptation to respond in kind and instead do good, this is a grace thing. Paul says, do not be overcome by evil in Romans 12, but overcome evil with good. So when you encounter trials because your authorities are being unjust towards you, your immediate response should not be, how can I change this situation? The response should be, how can I glorify God by doing good and being a testimony to others? Because a light is going to shine brightly in a dark place. You know, what can I do? How can I be merciful to those who are merciless? And to them, it may be viewed as weak or cowardice. But it doesn't matter what they think. You know, even even your coworkers pardon the cliche, would love to see you stick it to the man. But it doesn't matter what your coworkers think. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. And God is gracious to those who suffer and yet do good. It is much harder to do what is right and to do good to those who have treated you with evil than to take justice into your own hands. You know, some of you, this, we're all wired differently. You might have an Irish temper and an Italian attitude, right? Maybe you were raised and you were taught in such a way that you should respond with payback. You should give them what's due. And this whole idea of responding to evil by doing good is just crazy. And you're thinking, well, I know the Bible says this, but how how am I going to do this? And here's the reality. You can't. Right? In your own strength, you can't. We could never do this left to ourselves. But through the power of Jesus, he enables you to respond in love. That he takes a person and he changes that person fundamentally. Whereas before someone was vengeful and angry and full of hate, he can turn you into a person full of love and peace and kindness. Because third, Christ, his suffering, motivates and enables you to suffer well as you entrust yourself to him. That's the third point in our outline, that Christ's suffering motivates and enables you to suffer well as you entrust yourself to him. So he's talking about suffering, and he says, verse 21, 
For to this, suffering and injustice, persecution, you have been called. What he's saying is, if you're in Christ, on some level, you're going to experience this. This is going to happen, and here's our motivation, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. You know, what what I love about this is that Peter had said the exact opposite about Jesus some years before. Matthew 16, Jesus takes his disciples aside and he sits them down and he tells them straight out, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Jerusalem on the Passover. I'm going to be maligned by the religious leaders and I'm going to be killed. I'm going to die. And after Jesus is done talking, Peter takes him aside. He's like, he rebukes him even. He says, Jesus, you're, you're crazy. I'm never going to let this happen to you. You remember what Jesus says? He says, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Suffering was part of God's plan. That was God's idea. And if Jesus didn't suffer, we'd be dead in our sin. We'd be lost. We'd have no hope. And God used the greatest act of evil in the history of the universe to bring about the greatest good in the universe because he needed to suffer to save us. And so God calls us to suffer that we might point others to him. So here's Peter, 30-some years after that, and he has changed his tune dramatically. And he holds up Jesus as an example of suffering to help us as we suffer. Holds him up as an example or a pattern. Remember, remember when you were in kindergarten? Some of us remember. I have a daughter in kindergarten. They gave you these large sheets of paper with a big, big bold letters, and you're meant to trace out those letters so then you can learn how to write those letters on your own. I still have messy handwriting, but I do know how to write letters. So that's something like that example, that pattern is something like what Jesus did for us. He not only suffered and died for us that we can be freed from sin. He was not only our substitute. We're going to talk about his awesome atonement next week in verses 24 and 25. But he's also our example to teach us how to suffer well. And here in in verse 22, he starts loosely quoting from Isaiah 53. He says, he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Not one time did Jesus ever return evil for evil. I mean, you think you're being treated unjust at work. This guy suffered unimaginable injustice, and he never once responded sinfully. He never talked back. He never lied. Verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. I mean, think about Think about how much Jesus was misrepresented and lied about publicly. All kinds of horrible, false things were said about him. And and when you're in those shoes, right, your strongest desire is to return the insult. But Jesus, instead of returning it, he loved them. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. You have heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So not only was he mocked and reviled, but he even suffered and didn't return evil. That's why it says when he suffered, he did not threaten. I mean, when Jesus was on the cross, he could have said, hey, when I come back, you're going to get what's coming, right? 
Remember what he said? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we've been so trained to think that vengeance is satisfying, and it's not. And it just makes you bitter. And you've probably heard the old proverb that says, before you go on a path of vengeance, dig two graves. Because you're just going to end up hurting yourself in the process. By the way, it's not a proverb of Solomon, some, some axiom that I heard somewhere. But it's a true proverb. So you say, what do I do? I mean, what do I, I just have these feelings of anger. I'm so incredibly frustrated with this injustice that I'm experiencing. I, I need like an outlet to, to get out. I mean, wh what am I going to do? I'm so conflicted by this. Here's what Jesus did at the end of verse 23. So when he suffered, he did not threaten, but this is what he did do. Continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So that's how he was able to endure the cross. He recognized that God's got this, and he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. The word entrusting, how he entrusted himself to God, literally means to hand over, to give over. In fact, this is the same verb it's used when Jesus betrays or hands over, or pardon me, Judas, sorry, uh, betrays or hands over Jesus. So we hand over our life. We betray what we want, and we, and we put it in God's hands because he's the perfect judge. God is going to make every wrong right. And when we take it into our own hands, we just mess it up. We make it worse. So hand over your life. Put it in God's hands. Because he knows your pain. Because he experienced it himself. And it's not like Jesus was on the cross, not facing even any temptation to return evil for evil. He experienced the same temptations, probably worse than you did, than you have. And he cares for you. And there's far more satisfaction in following in his steps and entrusting yourself to him than getting payback. Because payback is never satisfying. After the 1960 Supreme Court decision that found segregation in schools to be unconstitutional, a six-year-old girl, her name was Ruby Bridges, was the only African-American girl to begin attending elementary school at an all-white school in New Orleans. And this caused a media uproar. There were riots, protests, as she walked to school every morning, she needed to be escorted by four federal marshals. I mean, people screamed obscenities at this little six-year-old girl, and they threatened her as they walked by. One of them had a miniature coffin with a little African-American doll in it. And typically, she wouldn't say anything. She'd just walk with the marshals. Uh, there's actually a famous Norman Rockwell painting of her. But one day, she stopped. And, and she said something for a moment and, and kept going. And her teacher later asked her, you know, what were you saying to them? And she said, I wasn't talking to them. I was, I was praying for them. My parents tell me to pray for my enemies. So I said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. I know we're all in a different place here. Some of you guys are just, man, you've got some awful stuff going on. Instead of getting even, walk in the steps of Jesus. Entrust yourself to him who judges justly. Instead of returning evil for evil, do good. And show the world how great our God is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for 
your goodness. Jesus, when you were insulted and mocked and scourged and crucified on a cross, you could have jumped on from that cross and slaughtered everybody. I mean, you could have exacted justice right then. But instead, you said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you committed your hands, committed your spirit unto God. And I pray that you would help us to do the same. That you'd make this congregation so absorbed with the gospel that we would live out the beauty of the gospel, Lord, and show the world how awesome you are. And that you'll bring people to repentance and they'll see your awesome love through our example. We thank you for what you've done. And in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have the opportunity this morning to celebrate the Lord's table. And this just fits in so well with what we've been talking about. And I think of uh, when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples the night before he was crucified. He knew it was going to happen. He didn't try to escape. In fact, he, he even washed his disciples' feet that night. And he, and he showed them what it means to do good. He showed them um, what, a, what a true servant is. And, you know, he even, he even washed the feet of Judas. And I think if I knew... If I was with someone that I knew was going to bring me such deep pain, would I be able to do that? <laughs> but that's the love of Jesus. And it's the love that changes us. So we're going we're gonna to take the Lord's table and we're going to be reminded of that love. That these symbols are a representation of how Christ was broken for us and he spilled his blood in his greatest act of love. Um, if you're a Christian, uh, take the time, confess sin, examine yourself before the Lord. This is an act of solidarity as we together as a congregation remember what he's done. It's also a personal act of just coming to Jesus and saying, God, forgive me. Help me to live for your glory. If you're not a Christian, if you're not, and if you're not willing to, to turn from your sin and you're harboring these things, I ask that you, you don't take it. Um, but even right now, if you turn from sin and believe in the beauty of the gospel that he died for you, then joyfully take it and take this time to remember him. So the guys are going to come forward and are going to pass out communion. Uh, once you receive your elements, please hold them. And then I'll read from the scripture and we'll take them together.
1 Corinthians 11.23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's do that. Amen. Let's pray once more. Father, we thank you so much for giving us the most precious gift of your son, Jesus, whom you crucified on a cross, whose body was broken and whose blood was spilled so that you could take sinners like us and redeem us, that you could forgive us for your glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. By the way, after I give the benediction, if you, there's some uh, guys on the, at the doors with receptacles, please hang on to this cup and throw it in the receptacle when you're through. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You're dismissed.